Thank the Lord we are <clears throat> back together again, <clears throat> and um, I plan on uh, fulfilling what I told you that we would do. <clears throat> I don't know that it's going to be as short as I had hoped, but um, there's, you know, we've been in, <clears throat> we've been studying the firstborn, and uh, in the process of that, we found out that <coughs> Excuse me. We found out that um, uh, within Elohim, at different points and different uh, times, <coughs> that one of them or two of them, or in some cases all three of them, have functioned as an Adonai to someone who has been going through the corridor of suffering or has been going through the sufferings of Christ. And, of course, <coughs> let me tell you, anybody, that's why we were have to go through so much scripture anybody that represents in type and shadow of the firstborn they're going to go through all kind of sufferings because that represents the sufferings of christ and it also represents um <clears throat> the firstborn is not just someone who goes through suffering but who goes through that in a particular way and we we were dealing with that a lot in first peter we're still going to be dealing with it within the realm of this um and um, so I, I have a little um, thing that I wrote up in advance <clears throat> to just kind of give you an idea of where we're going and uh, so that you can sort of tune in, you know, from the very beginning uh, and then we'll follow through with mainly scriptures, but comments in those scriptures. So... Um, So, a general introduction to a study including parts of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Isaiah, and, and forgive me for my, my order of that, because that's not the order of their lives, neither is that the order in the scripture, but it is the order that I'm going to give it, because <clears throat> there's some really precious things at the end with Isaiah also along these lines. Uh, the purpose is to gain a new and important aspect of Adonai, how that person of the Trinity, if, if you would allow me just to make it singular at this moment, that person of the Trinity, how they function and on what basis they function, because we can totally misunderstand this and just say, well, I have a, I have a guardian angel, except it's not, it's God. Well, that, that really misses so far the point of Adonai and the use of that name throughout the Bible and where it's used and how it's used. Well, what we're going to get in this part of the study um, is we're going to get a completely new part of that. All that we've studied so far is still in place, but we're going to get a new part of that <clears throat> That is very important. And so I said an important aspect of Adonai. Okay, and then next, in, in doing so, we shall better understand our study of the firstborn. Okay, because Adonai uh, has a major impact on the firstborn and their um, uh, bearing of the cross, if you will, or the sufferings of Christ. Um, it should also help us to better relate to God upon his basis. Um, based on what we're going to get into, we really need to know this. I mean, all the other parts have, have been good and, and they're more of a positive thing. <clears throat> but this is going to bring in a part that if, you know, if, if it wasn't true of God, and, and it's not, but I'm going to use these words, um, an area where he's very touchy, where God is touchy. It's a big deal to him that we get it right. <clears throat> and um, so we'll get into that. <clears throat> and, and all of this is going to build as we go. Uh, in addition uh, to this, we will learn something more concerning the quarter of suffering in First Peter. Um, it will feature sections dealing with the pro-self spirit also which has been a very recent thing that we're 
focusing on trying to hear from the Lord and be with the Lord. And finally, it'll help us to better understand certain portions of the prophets and their writings that may have seemed less important. So if you've ever gone into Jeremiah or Ezekiel or <clears throat> some of the other ones, and you find certain areas, and we'll, we'll be specific when we get to it, certain areas we go, why is that in there? And why is it thrown in where it's thrown in here? <clears throat> oh, man. It's, it's important, and it's with purpose, and yet really the average reader would, would not see the importance. They would just kind of assume a certain thing that I think everybody assumes, and we'll get to that when we, when we get to it. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> this, um, the first part of this that we're going to get into is um, um, Jeremiah. And um, Jeremiah is, um, let's see if I got the, yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, Jer the book of Jeremiah, by and large, is being prophesied during the time of the times of the Babylonian captivity. Now we have to say, because it wasn't one big thing, it was in, it was in three different, deportations before basically everybody was taken out of, <clears throat> out of the land. Now, there were still the really, really poor, and many of them ended up going down to Egypt. But <clears throat> the book of Jeremiah primarily <clears throat> is dealing with, with Nebuchadnezzar uh, as king over Babylon, who has come into not just not just Judah, but all of the nations round about, <coughs> and he's just a, his forces are just mighty, and um, so Jeremiah is basically uh, saying to the people, hearing from God, and saying to the people, "Don't rebel against this. This is of God." Don't fight Babylon. Don't fight Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> Don't have that spirit. Just submit in a right spirit and everything will be all right. <clears throat> That's the easy version. So this is to show uh, the, that there were three deportations. Uh, and it, and it's the, at the very end. It's in the last chapter of Jeremiah. Uh, so I'm just going to read this so that you can see that uh, Jeremiah was talking to at least three different kings um, about this situation. And <clears throat> there were three different deportations. So this is uh, Jeremiah 52, 27 through 30. And this is just information, but this will give you an overview in these scriptures. This is Jeremiah 52, beginning with verse 27 <clears throat> uh, to, through 30. And the king of Babylon smote them and put them to death in Riblah in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive out of his own land. This is the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive. In the seventh year, okay, here's the first, first deportation. In the seventh year, <clears throat> 3,000 Jews and, and three and 20. Verse 29, in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 830 and two persons. I was, I was just, you know how my mind works. I'm going, who were those two people <laughs> that were <laughs> through the number of? And then verse 30, <clears throat> in the 3 uh, and 20th year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebor Adan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive of the Jews uh, 740 and five persons, all persons were 4,600. Uh, so there's the three, there's the mentioning of the three deportations. <clears throat> all right, so now um, I'm just going to read that little introduction, kind of some things that I said here. This book basically deals with the coming of Nebuchadnezzar 
and how all the nations, not just Judah, all the nations should respond to his war machine. <clears throat> God's desire is for Judah to have his spirit and nature in, within the coming upheavals and treatment as they lose their rights. Now, I don't know how to say it any more clearer. That's what's going on. That's what's going on. I'll read the last sentence. God's desires for Judah <clears throat> to have his spirit and nature in the coming upheavals and treatment as they lose their rights. Going into captivity. Everything, everything is going to be different. <clears throat> um, all right. So we're going to start with Jeremiah chapter 9. And this is already after, I think, the first um, deportation. And we're going, to just, we're going to just begin to lay the groundwork based on the scriptures. And, and one thing that I might do, and I, this may be difficult, I don't know, for me to do. But one thing I might do is, if any of you particularly um, want... Um, like my notes for that section, uh, I'll try to I'll try to get them to you. That way you can read it for yourself. You can see the scriptures for yourself. You can see exactly what the scriptures are saying, <clears throat> and it really is important that we see what the scriptures are saying. All right. So this is Jeremiah nine twenty two through twenty six, and again a little note in advance. Um, this is the earliest, earliest stages of what God will accomplish. God is having to deal with the uncircumcised outside of the corridor. All right, so <clears throat> that means, let's see if I can find another way of saying it. God is having to deal with those who are rebelling and don't understand God's wisdom and don't understand uh, that... that uh, that God wants his son out of us, that God is after not um, uh, uh, a great victory. The great victory would be for them to be with him in what he's calling for. And this is all difficult for the uncircumcised. They don't get it. They don't get it. What? You know, we should be fighting. We shouldn't be submitting. We should stand up for God gave us this land. All these things that seem so right. Book of Jeremiah will, will shoot that down and say, no, that's not what this is about. And they miss God. So he calls them here the uncircumcised. <clears throat> God is having to deal with the uncircumcised who are outside the corridor. It is, the, it is prophecy against Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are there in the uttermost corners. Why? Because they don't have a clue about the wisdom of God in relationship to submitting to Babylon, his hand, God's hand. And we'll, we'll get to that, excuse me, eventually in the verses that talk about that where God is quoting through Jeremiah that, you know, the king of Nebuchadnezzar is my hand or my servant, and you're resisting me and my servants and my, my very hand in your life. <clears throat> um, they are uncircumcised, which means they still think in terms of resistance, using power to save themselves, Jesus says, if you seek to save yourself, you lose. But if you lose, for my sake. Um, and gaining victory, because we think the gaining of victory over everything and everybody, and that's, that's pro-self right there. That we got to win. We got to have the victory over, the, over this situation. All right. So now reading uh, verse 22, starting with verse 22. <clears throat> So he's talking to Jeremiah, speak, thus saith the Lord, even the carcasses of men shall fall as dung upon the open field, and as the handful after the harvestman, and none shall gather them. Thus saith the Lord, 
remember this is he's talking to people that are not they're going to go up against Nebuchadnezzar and they're going to be wiped out. All right. <clears throat> Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. See, here it is. What do you got here? You've got somebody who's uncircumcised in, the, in their heart and they don't understand his wisdom. They don't understand um, his spirit, his mind, his way. And, uh, <clears throat> and neither let the mighty man glory in his might. And so here is the mighty man. Here's the one who is, he's got, I, we can fight. We can do this. We can take down Nebuchadnezzar. You know how? God is with us. And they're, they're saying all the right things that the world would say. But they're totally uncircumcised. They're totally apart from God. Um, but let him that glory glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me do you see that see he's, they're glorying in all this other stuff they're thinking this is the way this is the answer and everything but he says look if you, here's what you need to be glorying but let him that glory glory in this that he understands me and knows me that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. <clears throat> in these things I delight. Loving kindness, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcision. They See, they assume that they're, they're circumcised. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the uttermost corners that dwell in the wilderness for all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in the heart. Okay, so above it appears that, cir that being circumcised in heart, this, the way it's worded, it appears that they're saying that to be circumcised in heart directly has to do with having the wisdom of the value of lowliness, if you will. You know, lowliness doesn't hack it. It's the nature of the lamb. That's more than lowly. It is. Our deepest lowliness doesn't touch. So he's not looking for our deepest lowliness. He's looking for the lamb in us. <clears throat> um, it's, uh, it seems that at the time of this prophecy that all is still in the threat stage and no deportations, I, th I think that there has been one actually, have taken place yet. In this chapter we see the real issues that grieve God's heart and make him want to bring judgment. All right, so did anybody notice uh, that the scriptures we were reading there are also quoted in the New Testament? Anybody notice that? Okay, so let's read, let's read the fullness of that so that we get the picture. First of all, let's picture, let's picture um, Israel and Judah way back at that time, <clears throat> and they they have uh, this thing coming upon them that is bad and looks horrible and you know stronger, strong and all this stuff, and. Um, so they're going to, so you've got um, them either, you know, you got somebody there going, well, you know, we'll figure a way out of this, you know, we'll, you know, we're smart enough. We, we got some good guys here. Or, or you got somebody saying, well, we believe in God and, and he can do miracles and get us out of this situation. Okay. All right. So now let's go over here into the New Testament and you have Jesus who is about to be crucified and you have, um, you have uh, Peter drawing a sword. <laughs> I think just before that, before the people came to take Jesus away, <laughs> Peter said, I, I think we got three swords, Lord. And Jesus goes, it's enough. You know, <laughs> he's probably saying to Peter, that's enough. Anyway, <laughs> instead of that's enough swords. Anyway, uh, so, <laughs> so, um, you have Jesus, and um, 
The wisdom of this world says, let's get stronger. Let's go get some more men. Let's gather up something. Let's do this or let's figure out a plan, something that we can do here. That da, 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 da. Or somebody says, well, God will work a miracle. God, that, if he's God's son, God's going to work a miracle so he doesn't have to go through this horrible thing. It, and somebody says, it's, all, it's almost like, you know, this horrible thing of crucifying Jesus is almost horrible like the monster that Nebuchadnezzar was when he came and was destroying all. All of us and and um, so with that in mind 1st Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness folks this isn't talking about unsaved people this isn't saying well if you don't believe in the cross then you're gonna be unsaved and that's really dumb because you're just gonna perish he's saying that the preaching of the cross of this method of lowliness and of instead of destroying your enemy or being smarter or being more powerful or even using a miracle to get out of it, him laying down his life. That preaching, in fact, the word there is the word of the cross. <clears throat> to them that perish, foolishness but to us which believe this is the power of God he didn't just meant he's not just meaning the power to save us or to help us because we're unsaved or don't know the Lord he means that's actually God's power not not great power to destroy everything or to do this or that and Jesus is the direct image of God in going to the cross and going this way so but it goes on for it is written i will destroy this is what this is what we say for it is written i will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent okay so god here's how he destroys the wisdom of the wise and here's how he brings to nothing the understanding of the prudent by this lowly this this powerful being called the son of god that has that could you know call ten thousand angels or whatever he wanted to do uh, to have the earth open up and swallow all of them all of those things lets them slap him around and lets them abuse him and lets them talk about him and do all that kind of stuff and um and this this right here will will take care of the devil, the world, the flesh, the da-da-da-da. It'll do all that in one fell swoop by his death instead of lifting one finger toward trying to get out of it or, or to use something other than this kind of wisdom. All right? Um, verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Now, he's saying, now in the light of the cross, where is the, where is the disputer of this world? Have not God made foolish? The wisdom of this world by the cross, by this being the answer to all of those things. Um, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. See, the world by their wisdom means, get ready, that they don't know God. Now, he's talking about you and me. He's talking about he's talking about we may be saved we may have prayed a prayer of salvation but we don't know we don't know god yet we may have been taught long enough that it's a slaughtered lamb on the throne and think that knowing that but we're not talking about knowing facts about that we're talking about dealing with that pro self spirit in us that wants to be high and better and known and you know uh, have a great ministry for God, of course, and all of these great things. Um, and by our wisdom and by our the way we're proceeding, it means we don't know God because that is God. That's not just God doing it that way 2,000 years ago. This is trying to explain this is God. This is the way he is. All right. Uh, 
So uh, knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay, so here it is. This is the Jews uh, need a sign. We are a miracle or something to, to work. Um, and the Greeks, you know, and the Greeks at this, at, you know, around that same time uh, were really smart people and they all could scheme and come up with where is the dispute of this world that's where all that came from and um so uh they seek after wisdom but we preach christ crucified he's this is the answer this spirit this way okay jeremiah speaking to judah this is the answer this spirit this way it's the same thing, folks. It is exact, and you'll you'll see it as we go through these scriptures. Um, but we preach, uh, preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, because they look at it and they go, well, "This is stupid. This is no way to win a war." Okay, well, um, uh, let's see. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, because they don't get it. They don't get it. And yet they're the ones who claim to know God. We're talking about God, Father, Son, uh, Elohim. We're talking about Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together in the way that they are. Okay? Uh, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And he's still talking about Christ crucified. That, that is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay, so this is what Paul's saying and pointing to that. Okay, this is what now I'm stepping up here is Jeremiah. This is what Jeremiah is saying and pointing to this same thing and the same spirit, not the thing, not just the cross 2000 years ago, but the spirit of it. And um, that worked in Christ because there were two other guys on the cross on, on the other side of him. They didn't do anything because it wasn't two pieces of wood and somebody dying on it. It was the spirit in which it was done. And so, um, uh, verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And when he's saying that, he's not, okay, here's not what he's saying. He's not saying, well, the very, the, the most foolish thing God ever did is wiser than the smartest man. That's not what he's saying. That's not what the context is, okay? He's saying the thing that they're calling foolish is that there's more wisdom in that in, in God's mind and in God's being than all of the wars and all of the hatred and all of the junk because life comes out of death. It doesn't come out of victory over or against. Uh, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, not the, not the, the reprobate, but the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So Rome is putting Jesus to death and thinking that's the end of it. And before too long, Rome basically will open the door. Because the, there's so many people coming to the Lord and knowing Him, and they're seeing Paul and, you know, you know Paul's spirit, but Paul's preaching. Yes, but Paul just saying, "Cut my head off." This is the same thing to me as it is to Jesus. There's more power in this than all of my years preaching as Paul. Um, that that this right here, this one act, if I do this in the right spirit, if you will, in the corridor, and if I stay in that, it's going to have an effect. And verse 28, And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, meaning he's choosing to use 
things that aren't mighty and that aren't smart and aren't this and that. Um, and, and, and you're not, I'm not saying that he's choosing just dumb people. Um, that's not what I, uh, the scriptures are saying. That's not what I'm saying. But those who don't think and, and, and uh, uh, are full of themselves, he'll eventually deal with all that. Yes, he will. If you got anybody you're idolizing that's full of themselves, they're going to be dealt with and you will be dealt with eventually because you've made that yours. All right. So, um, <clears throat> and things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, things which are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us, Wisdom. This is the wisdom right there. Righteousness. This is the righteousness that bore that. That's the righteousness, uh, the right standing, sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. All right. So uh, we're going to go to another chapter now. But I dare you to go back and read those verses um uh in uh Jeremiah 9 23 and 24 and see why Paul chose to quote those scriptures here and the answer is he saw Christ crucified in what was going on back there. And he saw Jeremiah functioning by the wisdom of God instead of the wisdom of man, which we, you know, our understanding of the difference of those two is so far from what the Lord has. Most people, honestly, with the wisdom of God, we, we got some, and then the wisdom of man, we think, well, you know, we just think we're smarter because of science or this or that or whatever, and it's just not even close. The wisdom of man, of the world, is dreadfully, horribly further off than, the, than you could imagine if you've never seen it. It is. Okay. So, Let's, uh, I think we can at least start this one, or maybe finish it. <clears throat> We're going to go to Jeremiah 24. And, uh, and, and of course, I, you know, I'm not going to preach the whole book of Jeremiah, so I'm trying to hit the high points so that you can get a real good picture. And, and a lot of the things that I have said tonight that we haven't read yet in the Scriptures, they will. They're coming. Trust me, they're in there, and they're the issues but we need to we need to pass through some of these things to get there. Okay, so this is uh, Jeremiah 24, verse 1 through 3. Well, let's just do 1 through 3 to start with. Okay. <clears throat> the Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord, after that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the princes of Judah, with the carpenters and the smiths from Jerusalem, and had brought them to Babylon. Okay, so this is so. So this is uh, what he's saying is that there that that I'm going to describe to you two baskets of figs, and one's going to be good, and one's going to be bad. But he wanted to mention before he got into that, he wanted to mention that there had been some who had already been carried away. Okay. All right. Um, verse 2, One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty... Okay, you know, this is not a Christmas song, you know, Santa knows who's naughty or nice. This word naughty here means vile. Okay, you can look it up. Um, vile figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Okay, These weren't, oh, you naughty little fig, but I'm going to eat you. Anyway. No, no, no. This is vile. You don't want to eat this. Um, <clears throat> even like the figs that are, uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, 
figs which could not be eaten, they were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil figs, very evil. That cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Okay. All right. You know, folks, we just see we just see the natural thing, the material world, and you know, but God's wanting to speak of the eternal things of his heart and the and the other things that just are so evil to him. <clears throat> All right. So um uh let's see. All right, <clears throat> verse 4 through, we'll read 4 through 7. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Anybody getting this? The good figs, are not the ones who stayed and fought and said, God gave us this. And, you know, if God gave it to me, that'd be like, that would, you know, if, if that spirit was on Abraham, when God said to Abraham, you know, offer up your son, your firstborn son, your son whom thou lovest. And he go, no, you gave me this. This is mine. You gave it to me. I'm going to stand up for what you gave me. I'm not going to let it pass. Or what if the Heavenly Father said that when the time came and, you know, somebody, the Holy Spirit or somebody suggested, well, let's offer, this is my son. No, I'm going to stand up for this. I'm going to, in every case, it is vile to the Lord that we're not of another spirit and understand how this whole thing works. We just watch the world, and then we watch, you know, Christian TV, and we go, well, we're going to be victors. We're going to, you know, pro-self spewing out all over the place. And none of them willing to go into bondage for Jesus or willing to go into death as one with him and his spirit or all of that. So, um, so he's saying, these are the ones that, they went into captivity. They didn't fight. They didn't this and that. They didn't make a big fuss. They went into captivity. Uh, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent. I, said, I did this. They didn't just go, and this wasn't just Nebuchadnezzar's evil intent. You remember it says that of Jesus, uh, God, the determinate counsel of God, offered Jesus up, whom you by wicked hands, you know, killed him, murdered him. We offered him up as a sacrifice. You murdered him. Okay. Completely different spirit. All right. So, um, out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. All right. So, if you're, a, if you're a good Jew, now apparently they weren't just good Jews. They had something working in them towards the Lord. But if you were just a good Jew, you would have every reason to say, uh, we're, we're going to fight. We're going to, you know, you would have every reason to think that way, except one reason, and that is the wisdom of God. God hath chosen the foolish things of the world, and it confounds those who have that think they're wise. They're not wise, but they think they are wise, and that and it, it doesn't have the substance of Christ crucified in it. it. It doesn't have the Lamb being Lord over it from the throne, the slaughtered Lamb being the guide of it, and and uh, it doesn't have them uh, bathed in that spirit it's just you know just christians just christians with their idea of good and evil christians with their idea of well this wisdom you know the the common wisdom would tell us that we should not just lay down 
uh, we should take up arms and do this because it's the right thing to do. Okay, all right, go ahead. I mean, they're going to do it. You can't talk them out of it. You can't even show them this. I mean, that's, they're uncircumcised in, in heart. So there's no, you know. Uh, and the good thing is, is that usually the ones like Jeremiah or Jesus or Paul or whoever's being persecuted and standing before judges and everything that would suggest this, <laughs> They're not going to listen to them. That's the same thing at 1 Corinthians because the, the, it's the foolish things of the world. It confounds them. They go, well, this is not an answer. Well, no, it, it's more than an answer. It's literally being partakers of the sufferings of Christ because we're partakers of the divine nature. That's what it's about. And when it's all done, that's what it'll be all about. It won't be, well, I... You know, I moved this, you know, this stand this far, and it, it really made a difference. You know, I'm using that as a, an example of some of the things we do and think that we've really done something. You know, the thing that counts is Christ and Him crucified. Still. <laughs> All right. So, um, for I will set mine eyes upon them for good. Oh. Get his heart in this. See when he's getting this spirit out of his own people. I will set mine eyes upon them for good. And I will bring them again to this land. You don't have to fight for it. I'll bring you to it. I gave it to you. I'll fulfill my word. You know, and that's what, that's what uh, Abraham even thought. You know, he thought, um, you see this in the he book of Hebrews. He goes, uh, well, he was ready to kill him. Uh, knowing that God could raise him from the dead because God had promised that out from this seed. You see what I mean? It's more about believing the Lord and believing his word concerning these things that you would do something that looks opposite, but you know that God is faithful to his son. And you know this thing will turn somehow or another. I don't have to know it, Father. I don't need to know everything. I'm with you. If it's go through Babylon, march me down there. If it's come back, march me back. You know. <laughs> All right. Um, I will bring them again to this land and I will build them and not pull them down and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Verse 7, and I will give them a heart to know me. Oh, my Lord, that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me. Oh, no, they're not just turn unto me. No, with their whole heart. They shall return unto me with their home. The very, well, let me just read my little notes and then we'll stop for now. Above, the Lord addresses the meaning of the good figs. He's going to acknowledge the ones who understand the sufferings of Christ and bow to it willingly, such as Daniel and Ezekiel. They went into captivity, not because of their sin or only because of the actions of evildoers. Instead, he sent them and did so for their own good. God's eyes are on them for good, that their spirit pleases him. And he will bring them back. Aside from all the good mention that he will lavish upon them as, as they exit the sufferings of Christ, there are yet greater things. Verse 7, he said, I will give them a heart to know me. How many of you really want a heart to know the Lord? I mean, really want that. Well, you're not going to get it by fighting for it, or you're, gonna, you know, you're not going to get it through all those means. You're going to get it by renouncing that pro-self spirit that rises all the time and says, well, this is God, or that's the way, or this is whatever, and, and, um, uh, uh, and says, Lord, you know, you get low. He chooses the base things of the world. You get low, and you say, I want your son in this way. Well, that's what he wants too. So you can't, you can't lose with that one. Um, <clears throat> I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. 
Now I wrote, these words are the long fulfillment of what he has expected for his true people, though many groups over the centuries have thought that they were the promised group, uh, and what he expected for his people, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Okay, so um, we are, um, we've been at this now for a while on several fronts. Um, and I want you to know that we're, we, uh, that my notes will be will be will have been written a long long before this certainly the scriptures and the true meaning of what they're saying and me saying that's what they mean has been around before jesus thousands of years um or hundreds and um you know this is for all of us there, there is no body worse or better. It's Christ in us. But it's not automatically that with us just living the way or thinking the way that we've always thought. It's going to require, um, I mean, don't you think it required for those who ended up on the first deportation um, some real commitment of heart and everything to have done that and please the Lord so well. We're going to find out that the next the next two deportations and the things that are going on before it are really, really going to anger God. Um, so what is the real bottom line of, of it? The real bottom line is He wants this Spirit, this Spirit of the Lamb in us. And... Um, so, if you could see how this is looks to me, okay? Y'all are looking and you you see me and everything. I don't see you, your faces. I don't I don't I don't even know who all for sure is on or not on. Uh, I don't. You know, I, I'm not going. Hmm. I wonder if so and so is right over there, and I'm going to talk to. I'm, I don't talk to people, individuals. I share. The word that God gives me, and uh, and guess what? I think maybe the next one we'll find. Well, we have to get past the the second basket of figs, but the next one after this we'll find. People got upset with Jeremiah because they said, "Well, you're talking straight to us, and you're this and that." And, you know, and the Pharisees did too. You know, God, you know, and it says that they they perceived that he was talking to them. Well, I'm not. I'm, you know, if here's the honest truth if nobody was watching right now I would preach this exactly the way I do tonight every night all the time I would do this you know I this is the way I do it so that if nobody was on and this and I would never know maybe it would be put in a vault somewhere and never brought out until 20 years after my death you know uh, which would almost be better because then if somebody said, this guy's preaching at me, and they called up New Creed and said, who is this guy? Oh, he died about 20 years ago. Oh. You know what I mean? Oh, oh, oh. I guess he wasn't. It's just God. God cares. It is not God's angry. It's not me or anybody around here pointing out anything it's just the lord let's just find the lord let's just be with the lord let's open our hearts and and uh, not lose what he's trying to say well, thank you thank you father for this time together and uh, we ask you to stir us up keep us stirred up on on the things that you're pointing out this pro self spirit all of the other parts to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, folks. Thank you. Thank you for being here.